Hello, and Hello. welcome to our March 360 talk. I'm Curator of Education, Anna Smith, and today I'm happy to welcome artist Trenton Doyle Hancock. I can't begin to do justice to the humor, pathos, intricacy, and off-the-wall brilliance of Hancock's work in this short introduction. Hancock has spun his own epic mythology in the saga of the Mounds and the Vegans, teasing out a rich narrative of expression and repression in a way that is somehow both accessible and extremely complex, working across the media of painting, sculpture, performance, printmaking, and even ballet. Hancock received his BFA from Texas A&M University and his MFA from the Tyler School of Art at Temple University in Philadelphia. His work has been exhibited in numerous national and international exhibitions and is held in the permanent collections of MoMA, the Brooklyn Museum, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Studio Museum of Harlem, and the Dallas Museum of Art, among others. Hancock was featured in the 2000 and 2002 Whitney Biennial Exhibitions and has been a subject of the wonderful PBS documentary series, Art 21. He is represented by James Cohen Gallery in New York and by Tally Dunn Gallery here in Dallas. I'm really looking forward to what he has to say, so I'll ask you to join me now in welcoming Trenton Doyle Hancock. see okay you guys can hear me right all right well it's good to be here it's, good to, it's an honor to be invited to speak here at the Nasher Sculpture Center Sculpture Garden uh, I myself don't identify as a sculptor but I do lots of things that take up space <laughs> I'm somewhat equipped to talk about sculpture I suppose um, but um I don't know, I generally here as of late have been starting these lectures out by um, giving a quote from one of my favorite films, Superman, the movie, uh, directed by Richard Donner <clears throat> in 1978, starring Christopher Reeve and Marlon Brando. At the beginning of that film, um, a young Superman, who's uh, more like a super boy, uh, is introduced to his birth father, who's Jor-El. And uh, it's in that moment that he receives his, his mission, you know, what he's to do in life. And um, that movie has meant different things to me uh, since I've been a child. I first saw it when I was like four or five years old. And I loved the character because, I don't know, through him, I, I felt like I, I gained some kind of empowerment uh, over the elements. Um, but there's over the over the years, I've gravitated to different themes in the film, whether it be you know um, this idea of place um, or this idea of um, what you get from from the parent and what's passed down to you and how you have to ultimately break away from the, from the, from the fa father to become yourself. Um, so what I'm going to do is recite um, a mo that moment, that pivotal moment where, where he meets his father. Um, so Marlon Brando starts, My son, you do not remember me. I am Jorel. I am your father. By now you will have reached your 18th year as it is measured on earth. By that reckoning I will have been dead for many thousands of your years. The knowledge I have matters physical and historic. I have given you fully on your voyage to your new home. These are important matters to be sure of, but still matters of mere fact. There are many questions to be asked, and it is now time for you to do so. Here in this this fortress of solitude, we shall try to find the answers together. So my son, speak. Who am I? Your name is Kalel. You are the only survivor of the planet Krypton. And even though you've been raised as a human, you are not one of them. You have great powers, some of which you have as yet discovered. Come with me now, my son, as we break through the bonds of your earthly confinement, traveling through time and space. Um, 
This is a piece called Frosty. And when I was an undergraduate, I was on this search. I'm still on the same search, but I was looking for something I could call my own. Some kind of mirror of myself. And so I took a mirror, literally, and I painted myself. And that wasn't enough. It still didn't really look like me. It looked like me, but it, it didn't have the depth that I wanted it to have. So I took that portrait and I glued it to a piece of tarp, a piece of green tarp that I found in my grandmother's garage. And it started to look more like me, but not quite. Then I took some silk screens and started to print on top of all of that information. Still wasn't enough. So I started to sand the surface. I started to distress the surface of this, this, this piece. It started to look more like me. And then I started painting on top of all of that information. And ultimately, what I found was a way of making work that was corresponded to how I felt as a living, breathing being. And it was at that moment that I realized that's what artwork to me has to be, or at least my expression of this art is breathing life into this thing and developing a range of understanding that I could have faith in and understand as certain truths. This is a piece called Pure In. I was thinking about the body and uh, my own body, you know. It's like the limitations of the skin. It's this pee pal. This is dick backpack. <laughs> so around this time, I'm a kid, I'm an undergraduate, I'm working through all these issues, I'm not sleeping, I'm reading a lot, I'm painting nonstop, um, trying to f and, and looking through art history and trying to figure out, ultimately, if I was to continue with this, where would my place be? Um, coming from a comic book background, uh, growing up in Paris, Texas, that was the only thing I knew as art. I had never been to a museum, really, until later in high school. So what ha I had established as a way to, a vehicle to keep my hand moving was maybe through comics or something like that. I thought I'd graduate and go on and, and become some kind of comic book artist. But I started learning more about different histories of art. The comic book stuff never left me, but came back in a different way later, like this idea of creating characters um, and having uh, these, uh, each character be somewhat like a separation of the self. That way I can step back and deal with different, um, how would I say, humanitarian concerns or universal concerns through um, characters. So one of these things that I came up with was this thing called a mound. And this is a performance uh, and it, that of me becoming this creature. I didn't even know what it was called at the time, um, but I knew what it sort of embodied was this kind of pathos. So when people came into this, this was my one, uh, first one-person gallery show uh, at the uh, Gerald Peters Gallery long ago. Uh, when people came in, they were expecting to meet the artist with a wine glass wearing a suit and hopefully they get to come up to him and, and say something, maybe pat him on his head. But as it stands, what they were greeted with was this heap, this wall, this mound, if you will, sleeping. So every um, 30 minutes, an alarm clock would go off in the director of the gallery uh, Miss Tally Dunn would come in and um, climb up a little ladder, turn off the alarm clock, and feed me a bowl of jello. OK, 
Okay, this, uh, and then the assistant director underneath the costume, the armature, was blowing up balloons that corresponded to the color of jello I had just eaten. So there was four different feedings. And um, she would shove the balloons out the butthole of the creature. So by the end of the night, there was balloon shit all over the floor. So this, this amounted to a sort of absurdist performance. Um, it was um, maybe a sociological experiment as well, and also an endurance performance, because I learned exactly how much jello I could eat, which was not as much as I thought. <laughs> And here we have the, um, the residue of this, this performance, which this is how I started to come to understand sculpture. For me, it was um, the byproduct or the residue of some other action. Like, to me, I equated sculpture with function. Like, that was, to me, the most important aspect of it at the time. That's changed over the years, but it's, that's still the paramount for my own project its function. So on the walls there are plastic tops, which are Velcro to a wall. And this also came, arose from my search as an undergraduate, where I was looking for this language to call my own. I remembered being a child, um, crawling around the house, opening all the cabinets, and unscrewing all of the, um, the plastic tops from the detergent, driving my mother crazy. but. I saw no separation between the plastic tops, the materiality of them, the color of them, um, the relative size was as my toys. So I would mix in these plastic tops and it almost doubled my toy collection. So it was, it was this amazing thing. But I think in an, at an early stage, I was developing this relationship with objecthood and poetry. It's like, and function again, it's like these things which look like toys, maybe aren't, but they could be. And I think I operate still in that same kind of way where there's a subtle transformation of the things around me, which then I incorporate into my, my project. And here we have a piece that's just, in a way, a notation. Maybe this is what mounds spoke or what they dreamed about as they were sleeping. Uh, so this made sense to me. When I glued these onto this little piece of canvas and signed it, the signature was me endorsing this idea. This is me standing by this. So this was abstraction to me. This was me starting to understand what that language was and develop, developing um, sort of a spectrum that I could go up and down of representation. This is one of the first mounds that I ever made. This is a coon wound. This is um, a malformed mound. He's the Babiever. The title of this piece is, Then I Saw Her Face. Now I'm a Babiever. <laughs> An egromaniac five times fast. Coon Bear, the legend. And then there's Junior. Um, this character will pop up quite a bit in the rest of the, uh, the lecture. So I went off to graduate school and I was roommates with a few vegans, a couple of this um, husband and wife. And um, they were nice people, nice enough. They were uh, designers, uh, uh, landscape architects. They had a, a love of high design, which all the furniture was, and it was very hard for me to sit on. I mean, they weighed about 80 pounds a piece, and me, I'm a big guy, so it hurt. So I don't know, being in this environment with these guys was a learning experience, but it also set up this sort of polarity. It's like, ah, what kind of people are these? And you know, I could get with the fact they didn't eat any meat, or they had these ideal, you know, ideals that were um, opposite of my own, but they were so preachy about it. Um, it just got to be a really crazy living situation. So the only way I knew to get back at them was to make really nasty drawings of them. <laughs> so um, here's me at the dinner table eating vegans. Um, and this piece is called salad because when vegans get together, it's called a salad. 
Okay, and then at, when I graduated from, um, this was at, um, in Philadelphia at Tyler, where I got my MFA. When I graduated, I came back to, to, it was in Houston, part of the core program, and I continued to draw these vegan characters, but the more I drew them, the more I stripped away their humanity. Uh, I plucked their hair out, and their bones started to protrude in places bones shouldn't even be. They became more alien-like, more insect-like, more goblin-esque. And here's yet another uh, rendition of this salad kind of a formation. So I'm showing, I'm showing you these things. I mean, on one layer of it is this absurdist, absurdist tendency to uh, satire whatever's around me, to make fun of everything, and no one is safe, nothing is safe, no institution is safe. But on another level, you just want to make something beautiful sometimes, and you want to figure out a way uh, to, uh, to interlock different aspects of your vocabulary with one another in a way that you can start to compose things you haven't seen. So that's what this is all about, having the salad. It's like, okay, then I can lock all these bone forms together. It's a very, um, you know, it's an aesthetic idea. Okay, I don't know who that kid is. But <clears throat> so when I was in the fourth grade, I came up with this character called Torpedo Boy. And I had just gotten glasses, and I wasn't feeling very secure about myself. My self-esteem was pretty low at times. Uh, but I had this skill. I could draw, and I could go into my own imagination and stay there and mine my imagination and bring things to real life, which was a blessing. Um, to be able to do because it created um, a mechanism for me to stay sane. But I started to um, write stories about Torpedo Boy. He'd get in adventures, then I would illustrate those stories. Um, there's a few seats up here at the front if you guys want to want to come on up here. Um, So I, I revived Torpedo Boy later in life. Um, and when he reemerged, he brought with it the residue of that expanse of my living. He became adult, and his concerns were more uh, related to the limitations of the flesh. And also, I think Torpedo Boy, for me, started to be equated with the ego of the artist. It's like, you know, Stan Lee would say, with great power comes great responsibility. Well, Torpedo Boy gives me a way to talk about that power that we have as artists, this ability to see through objects, see through things, see the essence of things. But sometimes you don't, you know, fulfill this uh, requirement. Um, and here's a piece of Torpedo Boy stepping on someone's face. This is called Leave Salem. He abuses his power, this character. Torpedo Boy kills shoplifters, so don't shoplift. <laughs> He'll get you. Okay? And this is a part of a series of ten drawings uh, that was then part of yet another larger series. But in, within it, I arti articulated even further the um, character of Torpedo Boy. Like he um, is the um, opposite of, well, he's not the opposite of the vegans, but he's to protect uh, the mounds against these vegans. So he has his place in this ecosystem, but he's abusing it. And in this particular story, Torpedo Boy goes into the underworld, into the sewer, and steals tofu from the vegans who are having their sacred meal. They're not bothering anyone, but Torpedo Boy becomes the antagonist in this situation. The, the script has been flipped. Um, Torpedo Boy then takes his stolen um, tofu and ducks into an alleyway where he sees a, a beautiful prostitute, which he offers his, his, um, his tofu to in exchange for her services. Her name's Trudy Fluso, by the way. I've met a few Trudy Flusos. Um, this is um, a painting I did in graduate school called Wow, That's Me. And, you know, I was 
painting these mounds, and I didn't quite know what they were or how they fit in anything, um, but at, I was still going deep into myself and trying to figure these things out. And so this was a painting of a mound um, going within himself. So he's looking at his own innards, which, is, which I have come to know as mound meat, um, because it's the meat of the mound, and it looks also like a bunch of mounds at a meeting. And, he, and it's saying, wow, that's me, wow, that's me, over and over again. And this was one of the first times that I actually carved right into the canvas, so the words are carved out of that surface. So, you know, this idea of sculpture, I'm trying to figure out what my relationship is to it. See, I'm going to keep mentioning sculpture because I'm in a sculpture garden, right? Um, but I knew it, for me, the painting, there's a distance where it stops being a painting and then becomes a sculpture. And I never wanted that to, uh, I needed to know what that meant for myself. Like, when is too much? When is it building off of the canvas too much? And then it becomes some other experience. It's not about illusion any longer. Um, so that was me figuring that out. So I continued to do these mound meets, this, this color palette, this black, white, and pink. Um, it was a way for me to sort of zone out and just do something um, experimental, figure out different compositions or whatever. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the wall and my relationship to the wall and wall drawing is yet another way to build um, something sculptural. Uh, maybe, maybe the idea of concrete poetry is more applicable here. And this is actually at the Fort Worth Modern at the old space. I think they told me I was the last living artist to have a show in it. So much in the same way as I would loop the mound together to form mound meat or the vegans to form salad, I figured that I could clump together or have a module that then multiplies and divides and becomes these bigger situations. Um, and ultimately, I started to use this at the service of creating environments to have paintings. So I call it the extended field of painting, where I then, you know, I create this wall drawing, which in and of itself should be an interesting thing. Um, and then on top of that, I can place in context these other situations. Sorry, that's at, in Rotterdam, a show I had at a museum there. This is at the old um, uh, Folk Art Museum in New York. Uh, this is in Istanbul, at the Istanbul Biennial in 2003. Um, when I came in, they asked me, so what, do you need anything for your installation? I said, yeah, bring me a toilet. And they're like, excuse me? I said, yeah, a toilet. Just bring it in there, set it down in the, the middle of the floor. Uh, because I want people to have a bench to sit on when they're looking at the work. I don't know. I get most of my inspiration sitting on a toilet. I thought maybe it would. So now I'm going to tell stories. Um, 50,000 years ago, there was an ape man named Homer Buctus. And Homer Buctus, he was uh, he's a pretty simple character. He just he went out and collected food for his family. He came home and, uh, and talked to his kids or grunted at them or whatever cavemen do. And, uh, but one day, well, let's see, I'll introduce you to his uh, wife. It's Al McCroin, his wife, and his two ape children, Brutha Scam and Chromalina. And he was a great provider for his family. But one day he went out into the field to collect food and he happened upon a field of flowers and the, uh, the, the color was so abundant and the, the various shapes and sizes were so many that he was overtaken. He didn't know what to do, so he began to masturbate in this field. And he left and he returned the next day and his seed had mixed with the flowers and up sprang this hybrid creature, and these were the mounds. And the flowers began to speak to Homer Buctus. They said, Homer Buctus, we love you, and we want you to be a loving and caring father for all of your new mound babies. And he was overcome with joy. 
And he returned every day and fertilized the field. And new mound babies popped up. So ultimately there was thousands upon thousands of them. You can see his central spraying spot here. And this is a piece called Fresher Field. And I counted, and there's exactly 1,000 little baby mounds in this piece. And here we have a detail. <clears throat> some of them have heads, some of them don't. They, but they, to me, it was an opportunity to play with the iconography of my, uh, of my life. All, you know, pop cultural references, uh, religious references, whatever they could be dumped into this mound field and dealt with on this very even plane. Some things that could be construed as bad, others, um, you know, not so bad. So again, this is me building up to a way to articulate a larger situation or a painting. Uh, my paintings are so kind of tactile and built up with stuff that sometimes I hesitate to call them paintings. But this has enough paint in it that I will call it a painting. This is a piece called Choir. And what I wanted to do was have this thing where you look into this window of all baby mounds speaking their first words, which are colors. And it was this very harmonious scene, kind of like Eden, if you will. Now I'll go behind the scenes. We'll pull back the curtain. I'll show you how these things are made. And this is that same piece. It's flipped over. And cut out of the surface are the, like, the word orange. So I'll take orange felt and glue that. And what you're looking at is orange through the orange. And then on top of that, I start to methodically build the layers. Um, as you can see, the mound stripes have not been put in yet. But their placement has. And having a background as a printmaker helps me see these layers, see these systems, and helps me separate them out and understand when enough is enough or when it's not enough. So here you can see the scale of that particular work. And this is a piece called We Love You. Back when those flowers were speaking to Homer Buckter saying, we love you, we love you. I thought, hey, how creepy is that to have flowers talking to you? So maybe I'll do a work that, um, that deals with that. But also, it's like I'm double dutying here. I'm just trying to come up with a new visual situation that I can then absorb into the project and, and maybe mix it with other things. OK, and this is a piece, a piece also called We Love You, where I took that module and then unraveled it and I thought, what would it it'd be kind of interesting to see the spoken words becoming the speaker, so the letters are becoming the flowers. And so with this, what I will call the Genesis show, this Garden of Eden type show, I did portraits of baby mounds. And I ended up doing 52 different ones. Um, I went through the alphabet twice. Each one's named after a letter. So that's how I came up with 52. Nothing is really random in, in, my, in my studio, um, which could lead to another conversation about the surrealist and their ideas about uh, contingency and randomness, but I won't go there yet. Um, this is a piece called I, 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 etc. Expect sex. And this piece, this is a, it's a piece named after my favorite horror film, or one of them anyway, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, uh, directed by Toby Hooper. And at the beginning of that film, the doomed children are in a graveyard and they see a drunkard uh, hugging a gravestone with a bottle of whiskey in one of his hands. And he looks up at the children and he says, I see things. So this piece is called, I see things. <laughs> And this is mound number one, the legend. Um, I had an opportunity to work with wallpaper designers. So I did these drawings um, and took them to the, the designers. And we spliced them together in this program and created this, this pattern, this repeat. Um, and here you see the wallpaper up in the gallery and the 
the paintings all hung on top of it, creating this sort of domestic situation. But once you get closer, you realize that this idea of the domestic safe, you know, the safety of the domicile has been interrupted with um, these fissures where um, severed arms or other types of um, grotesqueties are, are peeking through. So the two ape children, they found out what their father had been up to and that they had all of these bastard sisters and brothers. And they were so overcome with hatred and jealousy and confusion that they went out into this field and started to stomp out these baby mounds. And they would beat them over the heads with tree branches and strangle them. And all of their mound meat started to spill out over the earth. And mounds are planted in the earth since they're half plant. They can't move. They can't get up and run. So all of these creatures wobbling back and forth in fear and in pain created an earthquake. And the earth split open and swallowed up Bruthiscam and Chromalina. And they were banished to the lower realm where they were to live out the rest of their days. And whilst down there, they became... Uh, they stewed in their hatred. They wanted to get back on top of the earth and destroy the rest of these, these, these mound creatures. Um, and they procreated. They, had a, they created a race of inbred creatures who were also uh, bent on getting back up there and killing these, these mounds. And these were the vegans, the first vegans. And so this is what I call the Great Mound Massacre. It's a piece called, Wow, That's Mean. And so we see all these ape arms coming in and, and uh, interrupting the, the sanctity of the, of the scene. And everything's in upheaval. So it's more dynamic than, say, its sister piece, Choir, which is very serene. So here's the piece sitting on the top of the wallpaper. And here we have some schmuck wearing 3D glasses looking at the wallpaper. <laughs> and this is what the paper looks like under black light. So we used fluorescent inks to um, add to this sense of uh, displacement and psychedelia. So Homer Buckus, he uproots the remaining living baby mounds and puts them on a cart and wheels them across the world and replants them in different places and sprinkles seeds around them in hopes that one day a forest will grow up and protect them against these vegan um, aggressors. So let's jump 50,000 years into the future. Okay, now we're in the forest. I haven't told you about Lloyd and Painter yet. Lloyd is a father of spirit energy and he's able, he's the reason we can read text in this painted universe. And then Painter is sort of the other side of that coin. She's the reason that we can see um, color and experience color in that universe. So those two, they sort of look over these mounds and they sent Torpedo Boy down here to protect these mounds from these vegans. But, um, so I'm gonna tell you a little tale where all of that kind of goes wrong. Here's Lloyd sending a message into the forest. Get goat. He's saying something to this mound. This is a piece called Friends Indeed. This message that he's sending is getting louder and louder. Friends Indeed. Friends Indeed. And finally, the message is at its clearest. Remember with memory. And so what was cryptic before to this mound, he now has an understanding of what it means. It means he's about to pass on and become part of the forest again. Something horrible is about to happen. And the vegans made their way into the forest via a toilet bowl. And there was a terrorist attack committed onto this, this beautiful, serene creature. They climbed on top of him, stabbing him, and released him of his mound meat. And from that small graphite drawing, I did this large painting called Legend is in Trouble, which is very much an action painting in the sense that I wanted each mark to bespeak 
this horrible action. This is a yank, a tug, and a yank. Um, this is vegans do their dirtiest work. And here we have um, this painting is building towards this larger painting, which is actually owned by the Fort Worth Modern, um, called And the Branches Became as Storm Clouds, where the vegans are raining from the branches and falling upon this, this mound. Um, so this is essentially the same painting that I showed before, but I wanted to show it from a different perspective. This time it's more um, illusionistic. The space is quite different, and the attitude is different. There's humor now injected into the scene. So in kind of a Looney Tunes way, you get to see the antics of these vegans while they're doing this very horrible thing. But I often do that. I approach the same subject matter from a different perspective um, of a, another character in the story so that I hit all the angles. It's much like a filmmaker will do, you know, I'll do a close-up, I'll do a wide shot, I'll you know, have a flashback. So it's how do you create a well-rounded history? So here's the piece in my studio in an unfinished state. Gives you a sense of the scale of that work. And here it is um, where it's made to look small. So you can imagine the size of that wall. So Painter and Lloyd have come down to uh, remove the soul from this, from this mound creature. And this is a piece called Right Before the Fight Before. Painter and Lloyd are um, fighting to see who gets to have this mound's soul. This is Painter and Lloyd's struggle for soul control. And I wanted that struggle to be articulated with the paint and with how the canvas is intersecting and uh, the different um, patterns might be clashing you know, it's like, how can you articulate battle without being obvious? It's a piece called Toll, where Torpedo Boy has to pay a toll to get into the forest to save this mound. This is a piece called Too Late. Um, I believe this is at the Dallas Museum of Art, um, where Torpedo Boy is now trying to uh, scoop up the mound meat and he's crying and he's trying to patch this mound back together to no avail. And here we have Torpedo Boy tries his darndest to stop an oozing mound meat. This is a monolithic piece about 12 feet tall where um, you know, I wanted to show the fervor and the, uh, this kind of maniacal activity of Torpedo Boy trying to patch this mound together. So what I did was I dumbed him down to this, this form, which I could then multiply and create this, this new situation. The legend breathes his very first death breath. The legend attempts to put out his own fire of life. So when the mound meat hits the ground, it becomes as fire, and it rises up and singes this mound's fur. So as a defense mechanism, he shoots out cool streams of mound meat to put out the hot, but he didn't realize that it was counterproductive. The, uh, he was actually fueling the fire, so the fires got higher, and he was essentially uh, burning himself to death. Sad scene. And this is a little drawing that was a study for um, the, um, oh, sorry, that's uh, the life and death of number one. And here we see the mounds, mound meat and his fur melting away from his body. And I'll go back. That's a close-up of, uh, of that painting. And this is a piece called By and By. Uh, it's about uh, 8 feet tall and, I don't know, 13 feet long or something like that. And here we have the mound. Uh, and he's completely gone at this point. And he's just a skeleton which is as a tree, and all the animals from the forest and surrounding areas are coming to pay their last respects, saying bye and bye, bye and bye. So 
So we'll go back in time a little bit. <clears throat> this is a guy named Sesum. And Sesum was, he was a vegan. He was a vegan priest. And, you know, he uh, gave Lloyd his proper respects. He, he meditated daily, but he knew something was missing. He knew there was something greater in life, a piece of his history that had not been told to him, possibly. Um, so this space left in his heart and in his, his mind was open for Painter to come down and, and tell him things. Well, what Painter articulated to, to Sesame was that um, vegans and mounds were actually fathered by the same being, Homer Buctus, so they were related. This blew his mind. But what also she, she told him were um, that vegans have been deprived of color for generations and generations, and he didn't even know what color meant. And she started to incrementally show him bits of the spectrum. And she said, through color, you can regain your humanity, and you be can become human again. And this was an exciting prospect to Sesame. So he began to, to preach this antithetical ideology to the rest of the underworld. So he gathered up his, his uh, vegan disciples, who you see here, and they went on their march. It's a piece called Das Plimt, and it's Sesame walking on a sea of mound meat. Here we have Sesame's dream, and here we see Sesame Painter's address to Sesame, behold Sesame, I am painter, and these are colors. These are the, um, the energies that have been withheld from you since the beginning of time. And here we have Sesame's mission. And these things are carved right out of the, the surface of the painting. So you can, almost as if by braille, you could read these paintings. So it, this is Sesame charged with a mission um, has to travel up to the overworld and befriend a mound, and the mound gives him mound meat so that he can use them in these rituals. So by taking hits of mound meat, a vegan can then become color-abled and see color, and thus their salvation, their humanity, is returned to them by that process. And this is a piece called Sesame's Chamber, where I wanted to maybe show the place where this uh, Di intervention happens, this divine intervention, Sesame's bedroom. But it also gave me an opportunity to hang paintings from the ceiling, something I'd been wanting to do for a long time, so you could see the fronts and backs of these. Um, so on one side, there's this you know, frenetic activity, and it's more representational, and on the other side is the residue of all of that, and it becomes this more um, pared down, um, essential, reading. Um, and this is a bed frame, a bed that I inherited from my grandfather and these dressers as well. Uh, I converted the dressers into speakers and playing through them are uh, Muzak versions of songs with colors in the title like Little Red Corvette and um, the theme to the Pink Panther, so on and so forth. And representing Sesame and his nine, eight disciples are buckets of Pepto-Bismol as if, as if they're buckets of mound meat. So I wanted people to come in and be overwhelmed with visuals, smells, and sounds. So here we have the Cult of Color um, in one of their uh, rooms where they're conducting all of these color experiments. And this sort of gave me a chance to have a conversation, say, with Her Hieronymus Bosch, one of my heroes. And this is the first miracle machine that I'm going to show you. A miracle machine was created by one of the uh, disciples who was uh, also uh, the smartest vegan who ever lived. His name was Beto Wachow. And Beto had five brains. And these brains could operate together to come up with unimaginable inventions. So uh, Beto was tricked into being in the cult of color. He didn't want to do this. He thought it wasn't good for, the ve for vegan kind, that they maybe should stay in darkness but he was brainwashed. And under this brainwashing, he created miracle machines. And what they are, are these um, ossetectural forms. By ossetecture, I mean um, 
bone forms that have been um, butted together to form a new kind of architecture. So he used that method, which he actually came up with himself, um, to create these things, where you could put mound meat in one end, and out the other end, color blasts came out so strong that unconverted vegans could see these colors and become converted, or color-abled. So here we have a, mount, a miracle machine where vegans are sucking mound meat through straws, thus powering the machine. Here we have Painter coming down to help milk a mound. She's humanely extracting this, this milk, this pink milk. And they're collecting it in buckets to take back down for the rituals. And I'll just run through some miracle machines. This is miracle machine number two, vegan made egg spit. Miracle machine number four, the patented energy saver. Miracle machine number five, the Deblin technique at work. Miracle machine number six, craft master. Miracle machine number 11, musacrilege. The very middle of a sweet journey. Miracle machine number, I think it's 14, the furnace that burned together goodness. And that's a five by five foot painting. I just I haven't been mentioning scales of some of these. It's also five by five feet. This is a miracle machine number 13, good vegan. Here's a detail of that work. This is a miracle machine called beacon. Miracle machine number 19, the hand of glory. Lost looses, looses, and losses. Stone prone. The abysmal, dismal, baptismal. <laughs> the cult of color. So where these vegans would conduct these rituals was a cave within a cave within another cave called the Blestian Room. Um, and this was the title piece for a particular show called In the Blestian Room. So right around this time in the story where I, you know, I, um, as the artist, I felt like I was right along with these vegans uh, reveling in color and having just a great old time, orgiastic even. But at some moment, I knew I had to break away from all of that happiness and get things back to dark. So it was this, um, I knew that there had to be mm, a rising action, and now we were at the falling. Um, so the purest vegans got wind of what these, these, this wayward faction was up to, and they started to send out troops in order to destroy these characters, and there was an air of paranoia and fear in the underworld at this point. And I was like, how can I get that sentiment, that emotion into the work, into my hand in a very natural way, uh, and allow me to just keep making work without you know, having to think too terribly hard. I just wanted to keep that momentum. So what I did was I took the whole vegans out of the work. Like you're not seeing their whole bodies much any longer. You're just seeing these sort of furtive actions or um, things peeking from around corners in this paranoid kind of way, uh, things happening in the shadows even. And the blackness starts to overtake the color in the work. <clears throat> and I was excited about this opportunity and I jumped at it. And this is the first piece I did um, called Aborted But Beautiful. This is brisk bones befallen, morsel, bound. Give them an inch, they'll take a foot. The third to the last big hurrah. I was very happy with this piece. It's rather large um, because I strung together all of these arms and created this new architecture for myself, which felt very much like a new kind of industrial revolution, very angular. I could almost hear cogs and wheels and things grinding um, 
in a factory of, so of sorts, but some kind of strange vegan factory. I don't know what's happening. Things were just out of my own reach. Like I didn't quite understand what was going on with the work, which I think is why it resonates possibly more with me today. This is uh, the March of the Ossa Lanterns. This is quick fixing and color mixing. Eight by eight feet. You are late. Um, install shot of the Blestian room. So I worked with Harlan and Weaver in New York, um, these uh, printers, m amazing printers. Uh, and I did a series of color etchings, uh, no hand coloring for any of you etching purists out there, uh, called Theosophy, Theosophied, Ossification, a process of becoming bone-like. Theosophy um, can be articulated as a religion based in the spectrum of color. So here we have Sesame. The Disciples, Symphony. And I took the title of this one from my favorite television show as a child, The Incredible Hulk. Maybe you can see a theme here. Um, and at the beginning of that show, uh, I mean, when the pilot episode aired, like before uh, any people were on screen, there was just a black screen and white words that said, within each of us oft times dwells a mighty and raging fury. Fountain. Aborted but beautiful again. Now, here's a sculpture. This is called Vegan Arm and um, has a steel um, armature underneath it and it hooks to the wall and it stands nine feet off the wall. So it becomes this sort of impossible magic trick. You wonder what's holding that thing up. And it's holding a bucket of uh, Pepto-Bismol. But to me, this was like a drawing in space. It was, it, as a sculpture, it made a lot of sense to me because drawing makes so much sense to me. Everything I do is based in this idea of drawing uh, and um, you know, how can you get from one place to the next in a very efficient way? And this, this piece to me was a successful drawing. In 2004, I was approached by Ballet Austin. Stephen Mills, who was the head choreographer there, wanted to work with a visual artist to produce a new piece. And um, he had seen my work and he was a fan of it and liked the idea that it, it already had this narrative structure to it that he could easily adapt or we could easily adapt and, and then uh, create movement out of. And I myself was ready to do something that was a little bit more risky, come away from the gallery's white walls and do something that I thought was more of a hybrid, something that was more real. And here we have Sesame. Uh, the piece was called uh, Saint Sesame, well, Se um, the cult of color called to color. And I designed all the um, sets and costumes and, of course, co-wrote the piece. So this is a good point to sort of talk about what happens with Beto Wachow. Well, at some point, his brainwashing um, click, uh, clicks away, and he, he sees things as they really are. And when that shift happens in his brain, it unlocks this aspect of himself called the black brain. And his skin goes from white to jet black. And he rewires all of his miracle machines to then be smiracle machines. And instead of shooting out color or colorful eggs and things, they shoot out these black eggs, which then hatch. And darkness babies emerge out. And darkness babies' only reason for existence is to destroy color. So slowly but surely, um, in this violent kind of a way, um, darkness was ushered back into the, the underworld. Um, to create one of the sets, set pieces for the uh, ballet, I worked with the Fabric Workshop in Philadelphia, um, where we took large 
uh, bolts of felt and cut tree patterns out, and those pieces were then sewn onto a, a support, which itself is made out of felt and canvas. And here you kind of get a sense of the scale. There's two people there, 60 feet long and 20 feet tall. So after that, after the ballet, I was excited to see how um, it would all be gestated. And then when I returned to my studio, I was like, what's, you know, what's going to come next? How will me being uh, affected, how will I have been affected by that experience, working three years on this piece? So I continued with the St. Sesame story and was about to bring it to a close. And I focused on this one icon, the head, the vegan head peeking out from underneath a rock or from around a corner. And I gave myself this assignment. I said, if I can take that head and use it as a module, how many different ways can I um, do formal, uh, as a formal exercise, how many different ways can I illuminate that head and keep the architecture basically the same? So this is a piece called Fear. I call these the Fear Heads now. And here we have, um, oh geez, The Calm, I Read, A Happy Place, and these are all five by five feet, by the way. Blue Bald Voice Effects, Hello Hollow Lullaby, a tippy head run. The crest of civil unrest. Give me my flowers while I yet live, version two. Mold. Here's a close up of mold so you can see sort of the way these things are built up. Ooh, duel by a bleeder. And here the paintings are uh, on the wall. And this is the first time I had stacked uh, paintings like that. It's the first time I'd actually seen paintings that large stacked in that way. And um, I realized what it meant when I stepped back from it. I was like, oh, it's like me dealing with the wall as a stage. And each painting is now as a dancer. Uh, whereas before, each painting was a situation that housed characters, each painting now was a character. So there was this shift that happened in my head, which was a very, actually very important shift, because that's the place I am now. So this is from 2008, and the rest of the work I'll show is kind of leading up to where I am now. This is Meddler. Munch. Um, this is OK Bouquet Today, our Miracle Machine number 94, which I used as a study for this piece, which is eight by eight feet, uh, called um, Dissension and Dissension. The Bad Promise. And so this hand reaching out, which I sort of uh, took from the earlier piece, Aborted But Beautiful, uh, I then started to use it as I used it as the basis for this sculpture, uh, which just came down. It was at the um, Olympic Sculpture Park in Seattle and was up for two years. Uh, and it's made out of metal and it hangs from the ceiling. Um, in the beginning, I wanted the piece to be sort of like a carnival game where people could come in and bring their plastic tops and throw through the holes in the hand and they would funnel down into these um, vitrines. and. Uh, I learned a bit about the bureaucracy of public sculpture. You can't have people throwing stuff at your sculpture. <laughs> um, it's not healthy. And uh, so eventually the piece, I maintained the integrity of the work and then left the component of the, the, the vitrines at the bottom where people could just come in from the community and place their, their plastic tops in the correct colored vitrine. So, uh, ultimately, they were supposed to complete the artwork. And it was in Seattle, and you know, they're all about the environment and stuff. 
Uh, so I was like, ah, this fits. And then the rain coming down and all that business. Okay, and here's the color coffin in my studio. So I've been collecting these plastic tops for probably over 15 years now. Um, install shot, work while it is day. For when night cometh, no man can work. And now we're on to this current stuff. We've done all we could and none of it's good, um, which is the title of a museum show that I have traveling right now. It's at the, um, it started at the University of South Florida Campus Museum and uh, went to Savannah College of Art and Design and is now at its last uh, venue, uh, the Weatherspoon Museum in Greensboro. But we've done all we could and none of it's good. This is like me dealing sort of with death, but maybe these ideas of birth, like things have to sort of die or melt away and transmogrify and become something new. You know, it's the phoenix rising from the ashes, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, things were lining up in my life, you know, these themes of death and, and birth uh, and me getting older and coming to a new understanding of my own mortality and, you know, I deal with that stuff in a very real way in my work. This is a piece called Smoked. Mr. Mouth. I'm starting to focus more on self-portraiture. So I'm kind of going back to Frosty, the first piece I showed you. I really do love myself. And I figure if I use my own body, I can... Um, stretch it and morph it and beat it up as much as, you know, I want to without offending anybody. And I get to take more of the responsibility. I was excited about actually taking that responsibility. Torpedo Boy and Heron Hazel. Unruly. It takes two. Man don't work, don't eat. Like a thief in the night, version one. Like a thief in the night, version two. It's a five by five foot painting. You are what you meet. And you can start to see the conflation that I'm talking about where things start to be really confused um, where the things that I had made in the past have become a sort of solid truth. And it's now me against them. And I can't distinguish myself from mounds or vegans because that is a part of my identity. So the new bodies of work that I'm working on now deal with uh, that struggle with uh, not only this internal struggle that we all kind of go through, this universal idea of struggle, but me acknowledging that myself as the artist. So in some ways, I'm stepping back. The camera is going one step back and looking at a Trenton Doyle Hancock, who's the artist, but it's not me, it's this other. So it's about as close as I'm getting these days to that responsibility and taking the full brunt. It's no longer going through mounds, vegans. It's not as escapist as that, or fantastical even. It's a bit more psychological. This is a piece called Feet. The Everlasting Arms, version one. Everlasting Arms, version two. We're getting toward the end, guys. Bear with me. This is Hot Coals in Soul. And with this large work, this uh, sort of large collaged painting, I'd been collecting my odor eaters for the past 10 years. <laughs> so as you can see, those became material. The piece doesn't stink. It's amazing. I mean, odor eaters actually work. Um, this is uh, Campbell Streetlight. The doorstop. 
Um, this is an etching that I completed um, at the Neiman Center at Columbia in New York uh, called Pull. Um, and this is, uh, let's see, hmm. a tidy sum, merciless is he. I can't remember, I can't believe I remember all this stuff. We've done all we could and none of it's good. This is a, uh, one of three etchings, uh, small etchings that I did at Graphic Studio in Florida. Like a thief in the night. Night foot. And this is a, um, another etching slash litho slash silkscreen that I completed at Mass Arts in Boston. And here's one of the current drawings. Some of these don't have titles. This is one, 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 and one. And then it all came back to me. All things known and nothing to own. Um, this is a piece that I did where I'm directly referencing myself. So it's this kind of third person removal. Um, and I wanted this to be the last painting that I did dealing with a certain subject matter. And it's I mean, articulated at the bottom. For the past six years, the artist Trenton Doyle Hancock has been creating paintings, drawings, sculptures, writings, and performance based on characters named, a character named Sesame. He was chosen to lead his people out of darkness into a colorful new world. This is one of the last paintings Hancock executed dealing with Sesame. Um, and I did this thing over at the Dallas Cowboys Stadium. Um, when I told my mom that I was doing that, she's like, finally, you're a real artist. You got something in the stadium. <laughs> and this piece is called From a Legend to a Choir. So that piece I showed earlier the called Choir, that, that painting, I used that as sort of the jumping off point to do this uh, large field. A lot of fun to make. I worked with Teasley Corporation here in Dallas who are billboard designers and billboard printers and what we, we did was created um, this uh, basically a collage of my own of my drawings and scanned them in and built this painting in the computer and they printed it out on vinyl and it went up like wallpaper pretty much. And this is a piece I just completed at Herman Memorial Hospital in Houston um, called High and High. And this is the opposite of the by and by painting where all the, the mound is dead and all the animals are, are grieving. Well, this is High and High where they're all saying hello. And this piece is uh, in a children's hospital. I worked with RX Art, an institute out of New York, institution out of New York. And what they do is work with artists to place artwork in um, children's hospitals as a way to promote, you know, good health and um, and to distract the children from um, some actually pretty scary experiences. So this is outside the radiology unit, and it's 40 feet long, and has the happy mound in the middle. Yes, ma'am. The uh, piece, the, the mound in the middle uh, is built up out of, um, I forget the technical name for it, but it's basically a fiberglass that's really kind of um, flexible. So I'm going to end this talk with uh, Old Judd. And uh, there's this, paint, this, um, this, this movie called Eaten Alive which is directed by Toby Hooper, same guy that did Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And um, I don't know, maybe this is coming out of my regionalistic concerns and, and me not being able to escape from the place that I'm from. It keeps pulling me back. 
Um, but the movie is made in the, in the 70s, and it's set actually outside of Longview. Uh, and there's this old crazy guy, this redneck. He uh, has a hotel out in the middle of the woods. And when guests come, they, he signs them in, and everything seems normal. And then he comes out as the Grim Reaper later on with his um, sickle. And he maybe chops them up a little bit and pushes them over the side of the porch into a pond. And inside this pond is a giant crocodile. It's a very strange story. Now the and the movie is really interesting because it transcends its genre just a bit. It feels like a, maybe a cross between the Italian horror of Dario Argento and maybe um, the films of uh, Fassbender. So it's like this interesting kind of color that happens. There's these psychological moments that seem like non sequiturs. It's like, what does that have to do with the story? It was just this crazy opportunity for Hooper to maybe deal with you know, the psychology of man or something. Uh, and I think I relate to, the, to this, this guy because uh, of his relationship to the crocodile. It's almost like he's created this symbiotic, uh, I don't know, relationship where the crocodile is an extension maybe of the forces that created him and he's feeding back to that system or something by pushing these guests into the water. I don't know, but the movie itself is just so strange because there's a moment where, I mean, you don't know why he's doing it. There's no reason, there's no backstory. He just all of a sudden starts doing this crazy thing. And there's a moment where he, the camera pans back and he's in his uh, study and he's trying on different pairs of glasses, and he's looking over receipts, and he sings this song. Down, round, tumble down, standing round in the rain. Ain't got no ticket, ain't got no bag, still I'm waiting on the train. Thank you. Um, I guess questions, is it? Yeah, I will entertain you. Yeah. When are the comic books coming out? Um, there's actually a large graphic novel slash monograph that I uh, did, and you can get it on Amazon. It's called Me a Mound, and I, I made it, I don't know, about six, seven years ago. Pepto-Bismol Pink, it actually came from when I was an undergraduate. I gravitated to that color as I was stripping down layers of, of the self, you know, literally looking at my own insides. But I think it really res resonated with me because of its dual, I mean, its multiple facets, like it's multiple meanings, like it could be something that's really sweet, or it could be something that's grotesque. Um, you can almost smell the color. And um, I remember I, it was like trying to reconcile this idea of uh, the comic book, me that loves pop culture in the comic book, and is very American with this, I don't know, more grotesque sensibility, this, my love of maybe de Kooning or something, you know, chopping up the painting. And I thought, well, what is the, the symbol of American pop culture? Like, what is the most, and it's not, it could be Superman, it could be the flag. Oh, it's Mickey Mouse. So I was like, what if Mickey Mouse got hit by a truck? And he was laying on the side of the road as roadkill. He's covered in flies, and his insides are now his outsides. And you see his black fur and his white, and you and there's the pink that's spilled out. I was like, I want to make paintings that look like Mickey Mouse's roadkill, that, <laughs> that people smell before they see it or something. And that's, I think, what I spent about 12 years doing. So Mickey Mouse has pink blood? I think so, yeah.
Yeah, that's, that's so far. It's 108 feet long and three stories tall. Yeah, my cousin just saw it the other day and she's like, I had no idea it was like that big. Because you really can't get enough, or what, you can't get away from it enough to get a good picture of it. So you can always just get chunks. But it's really, it's massive. You have to see it in tiers and different levels. Um, so I think after completing that piece, I was like, geez, scale means nothing. I can do anything, any size. And if you have the proper tools, you can, you can get things done like that. I get a lot of inspiration from animation, and as you you know can tell, all of my quotes are from film. So, um, what about making some of your images move? Have you, have you thought about no, that, I mean, really, I, that's something I thought a lot about early on. Is like, do I want to make that leap, and what does it mean to make that leap? Um, I mean, I love animation, and one day I feel like I will do something that contributes back to that. Uh, that culture, but I needed to do something that separated myself out and deal with the slowness of painting and the kind of engagement that you have with painting or, you know, or sculpture actually. It's like you, time acts differently and you, you take on a more proactive role. I feel like you can be kind of inactive and just watch an animation and therefore a lot of the responsibility is taken off of the, the characters. It's like it's, you know, how do you boil something down to what, what's essential? And I think it's like I knew my concerns early on did not. And it's funny, I kind of grew out of, this, of, of the 90s sensibility and there were the, all these young painters that were doing cartoon paintings and co-opting the cartoon mark into their work and people were, uh, you know, the larger institutions were starting to take, I mean, I think that in itself was actually reactionary to the political correct movement that was going on and identity politics and everything was really black and white and sterile and more about, you know, concept or thought. And there was this group of characters that came along and were like, no, we're going to do something crazy and it's going to be more about color. It's going to, and so I think I was an extension of that somehow, but I think I, I hit the tail end of the 90s where, um, I don't know, I was definitely like, okay, I see a lot of bad stuff coming out of that too. Like people that aren't owning up to the power of the cartoon mark. And I didn't want to be one of those people. And I didn't want to um, uh, disrespect the, the, the hard work of all those animators who draw all the time, probably more than any fine artist, and are just as capable. It's like, wow, it was so, like it's in a way one of the last things to be recognized as high art, because it truly is, especially you look back at Max Fleischer and all those guys from the 30s that were you know, doing it. It was high craft, and it's like I, I can't, if that's not something I want to jump into now, I'm going to do this other thing but always acknowledge and pay respect to, so. Probably by and by. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, no, there's, there's a, scale means a lot to me and I think scale is an uh, important it's just another thing thrown into the mix. Sometimes some things don't have to be huge, and they should be small and intimate and draw you in, you know, because you can draw someone in so close that then you can punch them when they get close enough. Yeah. But, you know, a large thing is like, ah, it's got to be bold enough where you can see it driving by at 100 miles an hour. But something small really begs you to get up in there and, um, and there's a certain kind of subversion. There's a, a power you can have over the viewer when things get smaller that I, that I get really excited about. Hey. Sure. Um. 
think with each phase of the, what we would call the hero journey, the responsibility shifts. It's like who, who you need to be helping at, the mo at that given moment. I mean, the, just the nature of the artist is sort of this selfish concern. Like you, first and foremost, this stuff is for you. Um, and I remember I was in graduate school and, you know, for most people, grad school is this, this time of breakdown, this collapse where nothing is real any longer. And I started to really doubt myself. I started to doubt um, my own hand and the things that I believed in. And, I, you know, I stopped drawing for a moment and just thought and kind of was like, what am I actually doing? Am I helping anybody? Is maybe I should be out there in a soup kitchen doing stuff? Like, what is this art thing and why? Uh, like, what are my responsibilities? So that was actually the first time that I even thought about that. And uh, so it was a very grown-up kind of a, a thing. And then what I eventually came to was two things happened. I asked myself the question, has art helped me? And I was like, yeah, well, yes, it has. There's been times when I just felt like, oh, man, what's it all about? Not going to a museum and get fired up. And some fire is lit in a place I didn't know could be. And it made me want to go to the studio and make something. It made me want to go to the studio and connect with a history of people that I thought were like mine. When I first saw a mother well, actually, at the DMA, it was like one of the you know, elegies of the Spanish Republic or whatever they are. It's the giant eggs, those black forms. And I mean, no one had coached me to think that those things were cool. It's like, if anything, I thought, should have thought it was BS. But there was this real, just primal magnetism to those forms. And I was like, man, there's something in that. And it's like, if I can do that for someone else, you know, incite that kind of change or that wonderment or whatever it is, then my responsibility in part has been met. And another thing was, I see how art connects to culture. And it really excited me. I got to study in Rome for a summer in graduate school. And seeing this environment where there was this immense respect for art, people walking on it, people um, walking in and out of it all day and you know, here's a Caravaggio and it's tucked away in this you know chapel somewhere but it's been there for hundreds of years and no one has sprayed it with graffiti like there's Bernini's and no one's like tagged them it's like what is this respect I didn't understand it you know I saw young people walking around but it's like it this heritage is something a legacy been passed down of respect and I was like, I want to be part of that so bad, you know? And I think that, I don't know, I like, I like speaking to people. I like talking about art and going to schools and that kind of thing. It relates to this other piece where, you know, as a kid, you're looking at Incredible Hulk. Right. And that kind of gets embedded in you, and you're like, that's mine. I can't escape it. Sure. Mm -hmm. Things that are new that are introduced to you. What's your connection to it? Does it seem like you can't really, you really fall back on everything that was given to you as a, as a, as a child? Well, yeah, I mean, because it's very subjective. Like what meant something to me as a kid may not mean anything to someone else. And they might be the same age as me. It's just we all have so, so different experiences. But yeah, I'm an old fogey now. I look at the current cartoons and things that kids have, and I'm like, that's garbage. But of course, when I was a kid, there was old fogies that were like, that stuff's garbage. The way you're dressing is stupid and whatever. It's just cyclical. These things, they, you know, and again, subjective. Like everybody has to find their own way. Like you can't, I think that's a problem is people want to, kids looking at art magazines. I mean, you kind of have to, but to find yourself. But I think it's more important to find what you're not, to, you know, the magazines and stuff help you find out like minds and who you are, but it's, you, the way to find out who you're not is a harder search, I think, because it involves, again, killing the father. It involves you uh, stripping away things. It's more, I think, an active search than 
saying, oh, they're like me, I'm gonna go over there and hang out with them. It's the fraternity, sorority mentality. Um, but like, how do you, uh, as an artist, how do you, how do you become individual? How do you, how do you build faith in, in things? Uh, it's hard. Huh? Huh? I got made up. No. <laughs> well, I had some amazing professors. I went to some really good schools. I have a great family, and they've always encouraged me to do the thing I want to do. Um, but. I think it's very important to write. Write a lot. Think a lot. Um, and be proactive in that, like that search that I was talking about, this introspection. It's like, really, who are you? Because uh, sometimes the thing you think you are, you can go 20 years and then something clicks and go, geez, it wasn't me at all. But I guess I was never like that. I've been really pigheaded ever since I was a child. So I've just been on this search to figure this thing out ever since I was three. Um, it's, it's a blessing. I mean, some people don't you know, figure that thing out. But you know, I had, I, like I go back to the professors, you know, at, a, at a collegiate level, these guys were also professionals. They, they made art and they, um, they're like, well, you have to be as articulate about your craft as any doctor or lawyer. And there's, there's no way on earth someone should be able to come and tell you what your art is about. Like if that happens, then you're lazy. You're just lazy. And you need to um, look at art, figure out where you fit in that system, and uh, be rigorous about it. And you know, if I just have to talk real talk, that's, that's what it's about. It's, it's tough, and you, and you get up here and you talk to people and it, because I talk to myself all the time. I'm practicing all the time to do this. I know it's a little unfair to take you off on a tangent when I'm enjoying your book so much and in your use of cartoon as a vehicle for self-expression. However, the initial image that was on the screen, where does that fit in? The, the, the image of white, Okay, I'm sorry. I should have prefaced that with saying, I, pre I should have prefaced that. That was the idea of home. That's Superman's home. That was the Fortress of Solitude. Yeah, I, yeah, I should have said that. Yeah, it's like, what is that thing? Yeah, this is actually, I do the, I do the um, monologue all the time. This is the first time I've actually inserted the image. So, you know, it's a little trial and error there. But say, that's the Fortress of Solitude up there. Okay, I get it. I'll do it better next time. Um, you created a, a world for us to um, go with you to, and then you kind of step back toward portraiture. Where do you see your work going next? Um, it's going down that same rabbit hole, basically. Just I need there's some things I need to figure out with that. Um, yeah, I'm developing. It's like I'm in grad school again like a self-imposed grad school. And I'm very excited again in a way that I'm not on autopilot. I feel like some of the, sometimes in an artist's career you go, you know, like, okay, I can make these. I can make them really easily and just keep going for a number of years. And if there's a validation for those objects, then yeah, you can do it forever. And I'm not that kind of artist. It's like, I gotta figure this thing out and keep it interesting for myself because first and foremost, it's for me and then, you know, and I don't think enough artists talk about the idea of entertainment. It's like, I'm an entertainer too. I want people to come into the gallery and be bombarded with this stuff. And it's, it's like, a, at the end of the day, I'm competing with theater. I'm competing with music. Like, you could go to a concert. Why go to a gallery? It's like, um, but entertainment doesn't always mean flashy stuff. So you have to figure out what it is and how you want to, new creative ways to engage yourself and other people 
So I can think that's where I am, but I can't exactly tell you where it's going or it wouldn't be worth doing it. Well, there's a sliding scale of comfort, I find. Like, um, if you're always seeking to be uncomfortable in your studio, I think that's also unhealthy. Like, there, I think there are these spaces where you um, know your material and you know um, what, you know how to gauge the response of what that's gonna be. And I think there's nothing wrong with that. That's just knowing what you're, what you're doing. Um, but I think there's a certain like the artist as satirist or the artist as crit critique uh, uh, or critic is like, well, you're a bit of a punk. You're going against a system. You're going against the norm or a certain truth that's been built up. And sometimes uh, it's not exciting enough to go against the truths that have been created for you. As myself, I wanted to create my own truth and then go against that. So I spent 10 years building this story that I now get to tear down. It's like I'm at once the oppressed and the oppressor. I am the man that I get to stick it to. And that's kind of exciting. It's very meta. It's very, um, I don't know, mindfuck if you want to say that. But it's, you move out of it, and then you're, it's this other thing. And I hadn't seen a whole lot of that, and that's kind of why I started this idea of the narrative. It's like, okay, I know how absurd that is. People kept saying, don't do that, man. It's gotta stay oblique. You gotta be in the shadows with your stuff. Don't be out there. You know, it's too, uh, I don't know, it's too Tolkien. It's like, uh, I've never seen it before. I won't do it. So I was like, I know I'm gonna get over it some, at some point. It's like, it could be in 20 years, it could be in five years. It took me 10, but I had to go through it. It's time, I think with a you know, exponentially fast-moving technological space we live in, time starts to mean nothing to people. And I think painting, I've always known that that's a space where you can travel, you can go back in time, you can make something that's a second long stretch out a million years, you can do all this crazy stuff, you know, the stuff of physics in painting. So, you know, that becomes a radical thing. You know, people, painting is dead, painting is dead. Really? It's like oldest craft ever. <laughs> and we're still trying to figure it out, you know? Cave painting, what I do is no different, you know? Just putting a mark up and trying to make sense of myself versus that mark, it's, uh, you know, whatever, signifier. Awesome.